everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, lecture, this first uh, uh, lecture on uh, uh, for the course, the Middle East 101, uh, which will be uh, given by uh, Dr. Clemens Shea. Um, welcome to those of you who came to the auditorium today and uh, to those of uh, the others who are uh, with us through Zoom. Uh, last week, uh, our uh, director, uh, Michel, uh, provided uh, an overview on uh, the, um, the reasons why Singapore uh, had uh, interest in uh, understanding, in uh, better uh, reviewing uh, the uh, latest trends in the Middle East. Uh, among the countries uh, that are of interest for Singapore, she mentioned, if you remember, uh, Egypt, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we'll look more specifically today at the last one, and in particular, more broadly, at the Gulf as a whole. So uh, the, my colleague, uh, Dr. Clemens Shea, that I will be introducing in a, a minute, will have the difficult task of uh, covering six countries altogether uh, in the next uh, one hour and a half. Uh, and with the title that you can see on the slide, which is uh, a good uh, uh, provider for the food, uh, food for thought for, the, for our discussion, competition within cooperation. Let me just briefly uh, say a few words on Clement. Uh, Clement Shea is a research fellow at the Middle East Institute, where he focuses on the history and the politics of Gulf states, and in particular, three countries, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar. He leads one public education series that you may have heard of, uh, the uh, series Bridging the Gulf, uh, where you can find on the website that uh, Clement has been moderating with scholars from the Gulf or on the Gulf uh, discussing all the topics, uh, either social, economic, or political uh, matters of uh, the Persian Gulf. Uh, in addition to that, he has been publishing extensively uh, on the Gulf book chapters or articles, uh, and in particular on Kuwait's politics. Prior to that, let me mention also that he was a Sabah fellow at Durham University, where he completed his PhD uh, in Middle Eastern and Islamic studies. And uh, before that, I'm uh, extremely happy to, uh, to say that he was also a student at Sciences Po in France. Now, without further ado, I'll uh, leave uh, the floor uh, to Clemens for this uh, lecture. Thank you very much, Clemens. Thank you for the introduction, John Lu. Uh, and of course, I've been handed the really massive task of uh, telling you about, telling you more about the Gulf region and of course the contemporary developments in the region. And as you can see, I titled today's uh, talk as Competition Within Cooperation. I did the same uh, lecture one last year for last year's ME 101 series. And at that time, uh, the region just had, uh, went, just had, they had just gone through a reconciliatory phase. So there was the blockading quartet against Qatar, which we will come to later on. But now this has been resolved, at least officially and diplomatically, at the Al-Ula summit in January 2021. And of course, it's been uh, one year and eight months or so since, the, since that summit. And we are seeing a thaw in regional tensions. We are seeing a willingness uh, you know, to uh, improve relations, especially with uh, long-standing rivals such as Iran uh, and also Turkey, uh, at least for some of the Gulf states, which had previous, uh, you know, which, which suffered from previous animosity in their bilateral relations. So um, today I'm talking about this cooperation, but also within the context of competition. And because uh, economic competition is heating in the region, uh, I will list uh, several examples later on. Um, and despite the shaking of hands, the warm embrace, there is, all of them are pursuing economic diversification strategies to the point that they converge and compete with one another. So um, to give you an outline of today's presentation, uh, first, I will talk a bit about regionalism and regionalizations, two very broad uh, 
concepts. Uh, last year, I talked about it, but uh, I'm not going to go, of course, into the theoretical debate, but tell you how it's relevant to what we are covering today on the Gulf. And, I, and then I'll move on to some actor mapping, meaning to say connecting the dots, connecting the different state actors in the region and their relationships with one another. It could be a broken relationship, a broken alliance, it could be a hostile relationship, for example. So this is the kind of actor mapping that I will show you in, in, in the next few slides. And then we talk a bit about the Alula Summit. I already said that it's a watershed in, in their, in their intra-Gulf relations and also a bit of the background and history of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, following that, I'll move on to economic competition. And I've already covered that, but I'll give you a bit more flesh later on. And also because of that cooling climate that, that you are seeing the region experience right now. Um, and I asked the question, is it a fallout between different states in the region or is it really competition? And, it, and if it's competition, is it beneficial or not? So uh, those are the questions that we aim to address, but also in a QA. and a um, Segment, I'll move on to middle powerhood, something that I've uh, realized and discovered that is highly relevant to our discussion today in Q&A because you know, uh, the region is made up of several middle regional powers, but without one uh, having a foothold. But now we are increasingly seeing uh, Saudi Arabia taking the lead under its de facto leader, Mohammed bin Salman, and I'll talk a bit more later. Um, but what we are also seeing is the US recalibration of its policies in the region, and we'll come to that later, and how this is perceived by the Gulf states and how they, they adjust their policies accordingly. Uh, of course, middle powerhood has to be measured in terms of its uh, material capabilities of the individual states of the region, but more importantly, by its willingness to act or have a proactive foreign policy. And for this segment, I will refer to Sauli's uh, classification. He has an edited volume on middle power politics in the Middle East. I would encourage you to, to consult their volume for, for more info. And of course, there are uh, several authors who contributed to that volume. And finally, uh, to conclude today's talk, I will uh, use or reuse Sauli's uh, categorization of middle powerhood uh, for the Gulf region. And in, in this classification, that you divided power relations over time and uh, similarly you know if you are to look at the Alula summit as a watershed as a reconciliation event you know overnight you have the shaking of hands and the hugging of two leaders uh, you know in in Alula but you know are the 
family and kinship ties going to be restored simply overnight? That is another question. So that is regionalism, a project I emphasize again, and it differs from regionalization. Regionalization is, is really, uh, I guess, the basis for regionalism because it starts off with a lot of economic activities that, ha that create interdependence between the member states. So uh, business activities, people-to-people -people movement, tourism, things that are driven from below and, and sometimes also by non-state and private actors, not just from a top-down, but also from a bottom-up. So people tend, well, analysts and scholars tend to say that, you know, regionalization forms that bedrock of regionalism because you have that, you start from the lowest common denominator, which is economic co cooperation, and also um, business, uh, doing the doing of business between and over across borders. So that forms that foundation before you proceed upwards where you move towards or move advance in your regionalism projects to see whether the states in that given region are willing to give up their national sovereignty for uh, a regional body. Okay, so I, I guess I, I sort of simplified that whole project versus process. Um, and when it comes to the Middle East, and today we are talking, uh, you know, a part of, a, of the Middle East, the Gulf states, you know, uh, there's been writing on, on, the, on the Middle East saying that, um, stating that, you know, there's a lot of political asymmetry, meaning that different states adopt different regimes, uh, different states have their own interests, and to the extent that they are unable to go past you know, that, that first level of regionalization, which is the economic uh, cooperation, the lowest common denominator that I mentioned. So without moving past or transcending that economic uh, level, you know, these kind of regional projects often fall apart or, or fall through. And, and the GCC states, however, and, and despite their internal uh, differences and, and of course uh, conflicts over the last few decades, has at least managed to attain that kind of economic cooperation. And even during COVID, the COVID period when the blockade was still in place, the health ministers of the Gulf states still coordinated their uh, COVID, COVID measures and COVID policies and met at, at, a, at a high level meeting, set piece meeting. So I'm just trying to give you an example of uh, these regionalism and versus regionalization uh, this uh, difference or progression. Now here is, uh, like what I mentioned, uh, I think it's, it's perhaps useful to talk about actor mapping as I uh, indicated earlier in, in the outline. So I'm going to show you some uh, perspectives by student groups. Actually, they came up with the actor mapping um, and, and this one is for the EU and this was done in 2017 when I was teaching. Uh, and, and this is the kind of uh, map that we, that I guess would condense the kind of relationship that different state actors have in a given region. And here it's for the European region. And of course now, as we all know, uh, that rupture uh, occurring in the European Union is, is because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, and, and this has severely, you know, uh, broken down the lines, the straight lines that you will see uh, in this kind of map, because uh, a double line meaning a very strong relationship and a broken alliance, of course, is, is either classified by a cross or a dotted kind of uh, line. So I'm just giving, using the EU as example, but you know, last year uh, we gave one of our previous interns, Ethan, uh, a task of doing actor mapping as well and to, to indicate the difference before and after Al Ula. So before and after the reconciliation, what was, how were the relationships in the region playing out? And, and in this case, of course, you see that he, this is just one part of his, all his actor maps, really. So in this case, the focus is on the UAE and, and the, difference, the different relationships that the UAE has uh, with external powers, but also with neighboring Gulf states. Now, uh, if you look at the, the screen, you can see that this is uh, the 2020 uh, actor map, which means it, it, it occurred before uh, the reconciliation summit. Uh, 
And you can see that with Qatar, there's a red line, and you see it says the continued diplomatic blockade and pushes Qatar towards Ankara and Tehran, Turkey and, and, and Iran. And you see that there's also a hostile relationship with Iran. Uh, and, and it says that despite historical ties, relations, uh, you know, worsen following the Abraham Accords as it is seen as a backstep towards the Palestinians and the Muslim world. I'm just going to use these two examples of, of uh, Iran and Qatar. Qatar, of course, that, that blockade has since been resolved. Iran now, interestingly, you know, uh, there has been rapprochement by Gulf states uh, you know, towards Iran. Kuwait just sent its ambassador, uh, reinstated its ambassador back to, to Tehran. And Saudi Arabia is undergoing talks with, with Tehran as well. And then you have the UAE recently announcing that it would reinstate its own ambassador to Tehran. So we'll see how uh, regional sands, I guess, shift in the sense that this, this was a 2020 actor map, but this has now significantly changed. If you look at this, the one that, this is the one that he that Ethan actually did for 2021, the, mid, the, the Gulf Dynamics. And, and by then, you can see that Qatar, the red line, has changed to a white line. Uh, and that, of course, at, at that time of uh, crafting this map, Iran was still having a red line. But now, we, I would say that the red line is still there, but it's probably a dotted red line, rather than becoming a white line itself. So um, I think the, the Gulf states are us are viewing and perceiving um, an, a, a more uh, cooperative approach towards Iran, and they rather negotiate on their own terms and bilaterally as well to measure the kind of terms and conditions they would like to see from, from Iran. So this is one example of Actor Map, but I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to say that you know, when you consider regionalism, and regionalization, you know, you need to put things in perspective because each of these states in the region has agency. That means they, they, they act in their own interests and some of them prefer to go at a different pace than others. Uh, since Al-Ula, for example, um, of course, Saudi Arabia has, um, has been the most, uh, has warmed up the most to Qatar. But the UAE and Bahrain both have been the slowest in, in uh, you know, uh, restoring ties, and, and this has moved really slowly. Uh, Bahrain and uh, uh, Qatari leaders only met in person at the last, uh, well, the recent uh, Jeddah summit, the, the, the GCC plus three. So you can see that there's a difference because Saudi Arabia is really keen to get things moving, you know, but the rest are preferring to take a, you know, they are okay with it, but they prefer to take a uh, you know, uh, a bit of a backseat in, in terms of restoring diplomatic relations. Now, going back to, to a bit of the history uh, and just for a broader overview, the, most of the Gulf states were previously port towns, uh, much like us, uh, until the discovery of oil. Uh, and except for Saudi Arabia, of course, which, which is located on the hinterland, so in, on, the, on the desert uh, area. So the way they develop that they, they engage in maritime trade before the discovery of oil and also in pearl diving, pearl fishing. And of course, the port is still a very, very integral part of their uh, economies. And some of them, such as Oman, for example, is uh, strategically placed at a choke point for where, where ships and tankers have to pass through, which is the Straits of Hormuz. Um, so the formation of the inception of the GCC as, as a regional body was in uh, May 1981. Um, and that also came about as a result of the Iranian threat because that came shortly after the 1979 uh, revolution under Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, and of course, we see how regional, in regional politics, you know, external events or external threats play a role as well. Now, fast forward to today, we are seeing some of the wealthiest countries in the world. Uh, the sovereign wealth funds of, of the Gulf states are ranked you know, in the top, top 10. Uh, and of course, we see that the skillful 
capitalization of their wealth and funds, uh, you know, puts them on the map, you know, and, and to the point that they are able to punch above their weight. Um, and in addition, and of course, energy has been talked about so much uh, in the literature, uh, but one thing and one point to make is that, you know, when we talk about energy, uh, and, and I, I refer this, of course, to the current and ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis, the Gulf states play a more important role than ever in, in ensuring uh, energy security of, of the world. And, and some of the authors, including uh, David Waring and Adam Hanye, have written about this in, in a more contemporary context and say that this group of states you know, actually hold a key to global uh, energy markets. And so you can see that kind of movement going on now as, uh, as Europe is trying to win itself off Russian uh, energy, gas or oil. And of where is the alternative source going to come from? Of course, uh, they will be courting and approaching uh, the Gulf states. And on a side note, and, and, and I think this is, uh, is covered in, in uh, last week's uh, discussion with our executive director, is, is also Singapore's uh, relationship with the Gulf states. And, and, and this is by uh, Li Chen Sim, who, who recently released this article on Singapore's relations with the Gulf. And she emphasizes somewhere in her introduction that in the article that, you know, our portfolios with the Middle East, Singapore's portfolio with the Middle East, you know, only geared towards the Gulf, only in the starting from the second half of the 2000s. And, and of course, you know, there must be some kind of pragmatism, you know, if you are going to do that. Of course, we have the largest trade uh, portfolio in, in the region with the UAE at the minute. And, and uh, G2G, government to government relations stand at, stand stands at its highest among the rest of the Gulf states. And of course, B2B as well is, is doing well, business to business wise. So uh, that's something on a side note to, to touch on. But in terms of that, that was the economic side, but on the political side, you know, um, understanding the, the different regimes and political systems of, of the Gulf states, you know, uh, many question exceptionalism, you know, are we in, in, in an era of exceptionalism? for the Gulf states, because these are states that still retain uh, a monarchical system or, or, or a constitutional monarchy. And you know, in, in academic literature, you know, the king's dilemma, as Samuel Huntington, Huntington puts it, you know, it's, it's the fact that when you want to centralize the state to undergo different kind of uh, state-led processes like uh, urbanization, modernization, you you would have to share power with different social groups and different bodies in order to roll out these uh, processes. But, but you see the Gulf states still retaining that kind of uh, uh, top-down, highly centralized control, which remains in the hands of the ruling families. Uh, so, so they labeled, you know, the scholars have labeled, um, you know, the Gulf states as exceptional in that sense in the political governance kind of Kind of perspective because they still retain this kind of governance and and it's important to to, to remember here that you know uh, that all of these policies that are rolled out in the region tend to be there in that small group if you imagine a pyramid the decision making lies at the top echelon of that pyramid now let's move on to a bit more uh, contemporary uh, Developments and I talked about Al Ula as a watershed moment, uh, precisely because from 2017 uh, to January 2021, uh, there was a blockade that was, uh, that was that started off in 2017 against Qatar, and this was led by Saudi Arabia, and include the quartet included the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Egypt. So that whole um, episode, you know, uh, attempt to attempted to corner Qatar uh, into a position where it would, uh, you know, cede to the demands of the quartet. And initially there were 13 demands, which later on became six. 
but you know, the whole point of this episode is really to um, reflect on how Qatar actually emerged from this blockade, not only unscathed, but stronger. And, and, um, and some of its long-term projects that, that Doha had you know, for, for, the, for the country were hastened or were, you know, um, were, were, put, were executed you know, in, in, in the immediate uh, announcement of the blockade. And, and some, of the, some of the policy responses included procuring food and other basic goods, included uh, opening of uh, Hamad port, uh, and also included new partnerships, especially with Turkey and Iran, Turkey for uh, military assistance, uh, and Iran for the use of airspace because airspace was also blockaded, you know, uh, in addition to sea and, and land links which were blockaded at the same time. So um, the whole episode of uh, this four-year um, blockade, you know, have encouraged many policy analysts to come out to say, how, have, how has Doha, number one, uh, emerge stronger, as I've said, and number two, how has it communicated its various policies to its own population and also to the international audience using a multilateral platform to show that they were under a sort of a bullying narrative, which worked, by the way. Um, so, so that was um, that episode, and, um, and following reconciliation, what happened? and I'm talking about this, this one year, eight months or so. We are seeing uh, economic competition heat up in, in, in the region, and, and notably between uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And last year, when I gave uh, the ME 101 lecture, uh, that Saudi-UAE standoff or, or spat has, uh, you know, just happened. Uh, and and, uh, and at that time, uh, there, was, there, was, there was OPEC Plus. There was OPEC Plus that, that occurred, that happened to, to so, pardon me. Just, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, do you mind? Uh, just, uh, hi. Thanks, thank you very much. Yeah, so let me come back to the OPEC plus standoff. Uh, so the Saudi UAE um, standoff in OPEC plus was because of the allocated outputs for each uh, member state or, or, or OPEC member state. And at that time, Abu Dhabi wanted to produce more than the quota that they were given. And so that resulted in sort of uh, some form of bitterness in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, precisely because the Saudis have been sort of the guardians of, or one of the pillars of, of the OPEC plus uh, group. And then came Saudi Arabia's program HQ, which attempted to take away the clientele from the UAE. And uh, this, uh, this program HQ, you know, set out uh, requirements uh, for companies who wish to do business uh, in, in, in Riyadh to say that, you know, you need to shift your relocate your HQ into uh, Saudi Arabia in order to, number one, benefit from state funding, state-sponsored contracts, and also to benefit from uh, the relief of uh, Saudization requirements, which meaning to say you don't need a, a, a strict national quota in your company for a period of 10 years if you choose to relocate into Riyadh. So in response, the UAE you know, um, took policies that eased the business and social environment further. Uh, at the end of 2021, uh, the, the late president of the, of the UAE, Sheikh Khalifa, uh, introduced a series of extensive legal reforms and new laws, and that included updated 
legislations in a bid to you know, uh, stay ahead of the pack, of the business pack in, in, in the Gulf, uh, not only uh, by allowing you know, companies to have complete ownership uh, under the amended commercial companies law, but also uh, in the social and private sphere to decriminalize consensual relationships outside of marriage. And then there are further easing of uh, restric social restrictions such as alcohol consumption, uh, which, are now, which is now permitted in you know, authorized areas without requiring an alcohol license. Now, some of the policies taken were also, you know, to, uh, to you know, build up soft power, and, and that includes a sporting scene. If you see, look at the table here, uh, and, and this is in football, if, if some of you are interested in football, uh, of course, there is the recent uh, you know, Saudi takeover of Newcastle United. And then there are also uh, clubs owned by uh, uh, the UAE's uh, Sheikh Mansour, uh, Manchester City in particular, a big, a big name in, in, in the English Premier League. And PSG, Paris Saint-Germain, uh, uh, owned by Nasser Khalifi, part of the Qatari camp. So you see that they have spared no you know, resources to build up soft power in the sporting scene, but also in the cultural scene, um, you know, you've seen various developments, and I'll talk about them uh, later on, especially for the Saudi side. Now, there are also pivotal events that we need to consider, uh, which has, which, like I said in my introduction, that has uh, reshaped the way uh, the Gulf states have, uh, you know, uh, adjusted their policies. And the first one being the US withdrawal from Afghanistan last year, um, and uh, which was a complete debacle. It was, it was uh, done in a mess. And um, you know, the Gulf states went in to provide and facilitate evacuation. In particular, Qatar and, and the UAE uh, were there with their aircrafts evacuating, uh, you know, Western allies and Western -like troops, NGOs, and also their own nationals from Afghanistan. So um, if you look at one of uh, the pieces by, done by an analyst, Kirsten Fontenrose, who, is, uh, who writes a lot on, on US security, and, and especially with reference to the Middle East and, and the Gulf, uh, she writes that you know, uh, the UAE is tired of cleaning up after the US's mess. And, and, and specifically, you know, referring to this Afghanistan uh, episode. And, and this Afghanistan episode, of course, runs on the back of uh, President Biden's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, which means that the resources should be diverted towards uh, the Indo-Pacific and to counter China, and now, you know, more, more recently, Russia. And again, uh, you have... So that's one, you know, uh, event. I guess a global, global event that has also resulted in a shift in policy by the Gulf states, but also the Russia-Ukraine war, which I mentioned earlier as well. That you know, uh, the Gulf states have cashed in on on, on the energy crisis, um, and the IMF predicts that uh, oil exporting states will make an additional 1.3 trillion in oil revenue in the next four years. Uh, and so this extra money means that the Gulf states will have budget surpluses for the first time since 2014. And uh, just recently, probably last week, uh, the ruler of Dubai said that its, it's, it's uh, non-oil income also uh, hit uh, 1 trillion AED. And, and so this kind of uh, budget surpluses will of course be recycled and reused for uh, areas of interest for the Gulf states. And not only that, but like I said before, the fact that the Europe has to win itself off you know, Russian energy means that it opens up a win new window of opportunity for the Gulf states to come in. And Qatar itself has pledged half of its total gas capacity to Europe uh, in four years' time, in addition to signing a recent agreement with uh, Germany. And of course, uh, the recent meeting between French President Macron and 
the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman also in also had uh, energy on agenda. Uh, so um, so we see this kind of uh, opportunities presented by crisis, you know, and the Gulf states are also there to capitalize on these opportunities. And we also see that with this opportunity, you know, comes a more proactive uh, leadership, especially from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar. Uh, but we also see uh, leadership changes over the last few years, uh, notably in Oman, Kuwait, and most recently, uh, the UAE. And so uh, one of the things that we should also think about is whether the region itself has you know, states that have been adopting balanced foreign policies, and in this case, Kuwait and Oman, which has traditionally uh, used personal or shuttle diplomacy uh, in the event of crisis or internal ruptures in, in intra-Gulf relations. Now, we move on to, I guess, the penultimate segment, which is on middle powerhood. And I wanted to talk a bit about how the region has, uh, you know, uh, up and coming middle powers. Uh, well, one of them, Saudi Arabia possesses that quantitative capabilities already, but it just requires an extra push in terms of its leadership, which has now uh, come to fruition under the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. But the whole point about middle powerhood, you know, is of course that, you know, how do you define a middle power? Of course, it's relative. It's going to be measured, if you're talking about quantitative uh, assessments, it's going to be measured according to the superpowers and, uh, and then, of course, relative to the small states as well. So this is a kind of uh, hierarchical approach you know, in international relations that also uses some form of quantitative measure of national power. And this quote here by uh, Martin White in Power Politics you know, says that you know, the last line especially uh, for a middle power, while yet it has no hope of winning a war against a great power, it can hope to inflict costs on a great power out of pro proportion to what the great power can hope to gain by attacking it. So in other words, punching above its weight. Uh, and you see this, you know, as, as I will speak, you know, about the, the small states in the, in the region, especially the UAE and Qatar, both of which have only about 10% of its population, which are nationals, and the rest of them are expatriates. So you see, you know, and I said also that power is concentrated at the top echelon of, of, of these societies. So this small group of people, the ruling family in particular, making the decisions. So quantitative, as I mentioned in the last slide, you know, and, and I highlighted in uh, grey here, um, you know, the, the Gulf states and, and their quantitative uh, indicators and you see that I think one, one thing which is uh, remarkable is the GDP per capita. The GDP, GDP per capita, you know, of course implies the amount of wealth that each citizen has and, and the kind of whole rentier uh, mentality and the whole rentier literature that has been written so much about the Gulf states that, that you know, the ruling families are able to placate its populations, they are able to, uh, you know, uh, ward off, um, you know, criticisms, and, 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 and that is through the amount of sheer amount of wealth that, that they possess, and of course, even more so in, in the current context when they are experiencing a windfall from energy money. And of course, uh, they are not too shabby either in terms of armed forces, although it must be said that, you know, uh, military capabilities are on, a, of course, a completely uh, different uh, story and, and point of discussion altogether. I think my colleague John Liu will have a better assessment of, of uh, the military capabilities. But if you like to look at, you know, the UAE's military capabilities, which has been uh, singled out as improving in terms of effectiveness, you can look at David Roberts' uh, work uh, on. On, on the UAE's military capabilities, especially when he references uh, uh, their strength from the Yemen war episode. Now, of course, I said that more than material capabilities, you know, uh, 
more often than not, you know, uh, middle power also means willingness, a willingness to, to act. And in the words of Sauli, he says, uh, taking interest in middling in the Middle East involves a lot of meddling in the domestic spheres of other states. So meddling in the domestic spheres of other states, of course, refers to some kind of interventionist policy, foreign policy. And he cited a couple of uh, historical examples. For example, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt, and of, of course, the Arab nationalism, and Khomeini's, Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran, uh, exporting the Iranian revolution, which uh, not only aimed at weakening Western influence, but also needed the support of uh, regional allies. So, I mean, when we come back to the Gulf states, you know, the, the, this fear of the Gulf states, and we talk about their you know, potential for middle powerhood, uh, we can see, number one, and I already talked about this, the skillful capitalization of economic wealth coming from oil money, gas money, and that itself allows it to do more than its size, you know, and especially in, in the cases of the UAE and, and Qatar. And here, um, Saudi also, you know, and I come back to the categorization that uh, uh, that Saudi, uh, you know, crafted. You know, in, he, he he wrote three. He divided into he divided the categorization of middle powers into three uh, segments: aspirant, constrained, and hesitant. And of course, I'm going to come back with my own assessment of, of the current situation. Um, and aspirant, he, he put, and uh, he calls these regimes seeking to play influential leading roles in their region and beyond, and are usually driven by security and economic considerations. Constrained are the ones that aspire to play the above roles or the aforesaid roles, but are inhibited due to a lack of capability. And the hesitant ones, are those that possess the capability but lacks the aspiration, the will, or the interest. So of course here, he, he, he classifies uh, Iran and Qatar uh, under as, aspirant. Uh, and of course this, I'm not going to into, to de detail what, he, how he justifies this. I invite you to, to consult his chapter, but uh, I'm going to give you my assessment based on what I've just talked about. Now, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, as you see, you know, uh, of course, the, the most distinct and noticeable uh, thing about the Saudis in, in terms of its middle power aspirations is about its religious legitimacy. Of course, as the custodian of the two holy mosques, you know, it, it, it possesses that Islamist identity to lead the Muslim ummah, the Muslim community. But you know, um, and I refer to um, Robert Mason's work, sorry, Simon Mabon's work on Saudi Arabia. Uh, and he says that, you know, um, Saudi Arabia finds it counterproductive, you know, when it comes to uh, exporting Wahhabism, which was a very conservative uh, brand of Islam, although it supports used to support, I guess I could say that, mosque and religious charities, but it finds that by exp if it were to export such a brand, it would be counterproductive uh, rather than productive because you know, they prefer to alternate between different systems or different brands such as Saudi nationalism, Islamism, Arabism, and now this flexibility has moved on to moderate Islam. And, and the, this moderate Islam buzzword has, has caught on uh, in the region, of course, for, for certain purposes. Um, and, and the primary one being to drive the social liberalization in the kingdom. And with, moderate, with the proclamation of moderate is Islam, you know, the crown prince is able to uh, you know, go on his vision 2030 uh, policies. He's able to uh, do things like opening up the entertainment sector, having K-pop concerts, uh, 
uh, you know, having festivals, and, and he, he labeled, the, you know, he has heritage sites that are now also promoting religious tourism, and also, um, you know, uh, slogans that attract, that aim to attract people into the kingdom to visit visitors, and such as 2022, for example, is the year of the coffee, for example, in, of the year of the Saudi coffee, to be precise, uh, as, as labeled by, by the kingdom. Um, of course, I mentioned that the, Saudi, that the Saudis are, the Riyadh is also a pillar in energy security, considering the European energy crisis. I talked about uh, how uh, meetings between European leaders and uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman have already occurred, and this lies in their agenda. And we've seen a very proactive foreign policy, contrary to what Saudi, you know, uh, Saudi described as a hesitant middle power in Saudi Arabia. Now we are seeing uh, the Crown Prince taking the initiative not only to resolve the blockade previously, but also now dropping that whole Khashoggi uh, case and you know rebranding himself uh, on the global stage. And and Mohammed bin Salman, and the Crown Prince, he has of course just been to Europe, been to Greece, uh, France, and also taken across 2021, since the Alula summit, he has taken steps to foster closer intra-Gulf cooperation. And also that is evidenced by the various coordination councils with each of the neighboring Gulf states, so a Saudi UAE coordination council, Saudi Oman coordination council, so on and so forth to align and realign their respective economic visions. Um, and finally, of course, uh, projecting domestic developments globally to show that Saudi, the Saudi Arabia is open to doing business. And I talked about this through um, uh, the music scene, the entertainment scene, and also program HQ that I mentioned earlier. So if you want to read a bit more in detail for, for this domestic developments, especially in the cultural and heritage scene, you can consult Iman Al Hussein's work uh, for the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. And she writes uh, uh, quite an extensive paper on, on these aspects. UAE, and I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the military capabilities that it has, and it was branded Little Sparta by the economists. Uh, of course, again, signifying that it's punching above its weight. And I, talked, I already talked about um, internationalizing military partnerships. And, and one of the reasons that it has diversified its uh, military cooperation uh, arrangements with, uh, is to put different, its eggs in different baskets. And, and also that also is evidenced by its abstention uh, in the UN Security Council earlier this year when the Russian-Ukraine crisis uh, broke out. Uh, economic statecraft, I talked about how it uses uh, its, its oil wealth to invest inwards, you know, uh, and redevelop and re-diversify itself, come up with innovative things to stay ahead of the Gulf Pact. And of course, Dubai here stands really prominent uh, you know, among the seven Emirates in the UAE uh, in terms of this inward investment and diversification strategy. Um, of course, you heard about the Dubai Expo and also the COP28 will be hosted by the UAE in, 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 uh, soon after Egypt. Um, so it has been, a, the UAE has been, a, has been a host to mega events. Uh, and of course, this means that it's, a, it's pioneering the mice industry uh, in the region. And in addition to that, I think you recall earlier, one of the criteria for middle powerhood is also the projection of power elsewhere. And, and this is also seen in the interest taken by the UAE in Africa, and setting up base, bases in Africa, Eritrea, and then uh, Somalia, I believe. Um, and so this also confronts perceived threats elsewhere based on uh, the UAE's anti-Islamist stance. And that, of course, stems from the top, from under the current president, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed. And finally, last but not least, Qatar. Uh, Qatar, of course, when you talk about Qatar this year, you talk about the World Cup and, and you talk about uh, 
you just talked about the mega events hosted by the UAE. That World Cup uh, is, is the one that draws the crowds into this small emirate and also it allows itself to brand, uh, to, to brand the country as a regional sporting leader. Um, and, and of course, through its partnerships with different countries in the region, whether it's for cyber security, whether it's for physical security in general, or even for the housing of housing infrastructure and accommodation infrastructure for the tourists that will come uh, in November, especially with Iran. Uh, Qatar signed an agreement with Iran to, to house some of the uh, footballing fans on Kish Island. Uh, and so these are the kinds of steps that it has taken. But more importantly, Qatar is also the largest LNG producer and sharing the world's largest gas field with Iran. And you see why that, you know, Qatar and Iran, the Qatar and Iran relationship you know, also stands to gain from the current cooling climate in that Qatar could be the gateway, sort of, for Iran to uh, further or deepen, you know, talks and cooperation for the rest of the Gulf states. And not forgetting as well, diplomatic mediation. And uh, Qatar has, has had a, a few decades of, of uh, track record in diplomatic mediation. The success, a mixed bag. But what we can say is that uh, it has succeeded in reducing tensions where, where conflict arise, where conflicts arise, but whether the conflicts are fully resolved, now that is another uh, question. And I've listed uh, a number of the uh, conflicts that Qatar has uh, put its foot in. Um, Finally, of course, uh, to be able to do what it can do, you know, to have such a, a proactive foreign policy as well, is also because of its security partnership, especially with the U.S. And uh, Al Udaid military base is the biggest one, the U.S. the U.S.'s biggest one in the Middle East, and also home to the U.S. Central Command and the Air Force Central Command. And most recently, uh, Qatar has also become. Uh, a major non-NATO non -NATO ally of the, of the US, which of course means that it gets to enjoy uh, more security cooperation benefits from Washington. So, I guess we are coming to the end of the talk of the presentation. Uh, I'm coming back to Saudi's categorization of the middle powers, and I'm, I'm just completely going to remove that whole hesitant uh, you know, box. And I'm emptying the hesitant box. Rather, I'll prefer to put uh, those that do not have a proactive foreign policy under that constrained uh, category. Um, of course, Israel has has Israel is not in the in the table, by the way. But Israel, for example, has you know come a bit of a way because it, of the Abraham Accords, but it's still constrained by that overall regional uh, narrative of the Arab. Arab-Israeli conflict and, and the Palestinian cause and the Arab Peace Initiative. So it's still constrained by that. Uh, and you look at the other states uh, that I've listed in aspiring and constrained. I talked about, I think you can see why Qatar and Saudi, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are under aspiring. They have seized the opportunities presented by the crisis that have, have, have surfaced you know, for the past two years, uh, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And they are being proactive, whether diplomatically, whether it's rendering humanitarian assistance, whether it's uh, you know uh, in mediation, or whether it's ensuring or energy security of the world. I, I guess that is still a, a pretty great area after President Biden's visit. Uh, but in a nutshell, they are you know uh, adopting respectively a proactive foreign policy. And you have the constraint section in, in the middle, uh, and I put Kuwait and Oman there because both of them have long-standing balanced foreign policies that they seek to continue uh, despite a new leadership, a relatively new leadership. Um, but also because Oman has fiscal and, and economic problems to deal with, which has now improved uh, over the course of this year. But also Kuwait's politics uh, is rather problematic. Uh, it often encounters political deadlocks between its parliament 
and its executive branch, meaning to say its cabinet of ministers. Uh, Iran, I think I'll leave my colleagues to, to expand on it on, on, on the later lecture. And of course, Bahrain uh, has now uh, you know, aligned its foreign policy according to uh, Riyadh. And so that's, that makes it even more severely constrained in that, in that sense. So, so we see this, I think it's quite pretty straightforward in the current context. Maybe next year you will change, maybe next year the actor mapping will change again and we can recategorize uh, the middle powers accordingly. Uh, in fact, Bahrain, I would say, doesn't belong to that middle power uh, quantitative criteria. In terms of quantitative criteria, it's still a small Gulf state in, in the region. And final remarks. Um, number one, if we talked about uh, you know, historical trajectory, you know, uh, the Gulf states have been have uh, risen to prominence precisely because of the decline of traditional powers in the region, such as uh, Egypt, such as Iraq, just, such as Syria, which have previously played you know, leading roles in, in the past decades. But now is the Gulf era, and, and especially KSA, Qatar, and UAE that I listed here. And I've also emphasize that the opportunities offered by ongoing crisis also cements their role in the international system, not least because of the ongoing energy crisis experienced by, by Europe. And um, in terms of regionalism and regionalization, you know, it's following, kind of following a Saudi-led trajectory at the minute, because whatever or whoever the, the Saudis approach uh, to to foster closer relations, a few of the other Gulf states will follow suit. So in that sense, regionalization has benefited precisely because Saudi, the Saudis have uh, embarked on a really proactive uh, and outward-looking foreign policy at the minute. How things will change next year, we, we have to see. But I'm going back to uh, the point that, you know, about middle powers, and the Middle East really now has you know, a few regional middle powers which are constantly balancing each other out. But also, this is a region where external powers, and not just the US, external powers such as China uh, and, of course, Russia, uh, take an interest in the Gulf states. They caught the Gulf states, and the Gulf states caught them back. And, and this is all comes to the whole strategy of hedging, where you do not you diversify uh, your, your, your partners and, and, and so that when you lose out on one, you have another one as, as, as a guarantee or, or backup. So with that, I conclude my talk and I thank you for the time taken to, to listen to it. Thanks. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Clements, for uh, this uh, uh, great and impressive overview of uh, the, the Gulf. Uh, just a word of logistics uh, for those of you that um, may not have joined us before. Uh, if you're on Zoom right now, you can uh, uh, ask a question using the, the chat box. Uh, please send the, the, the question and then uh, we will uh, uh, ask it uh, from here in the auditorium. Uh, to Clements. For those of you who are in the auditorium, please raise your hand uh, if you have uh, a question. Uh, maybe just to uh, let you have the time to uh, uh, think about uh, comments or uh, questions, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll throw a uh, first question to, uh, to you, uh, Clements. Uh, I mean, you, you covered a lot of things, and uh, uh, given the time constraint, uh, it was almost impossible to cover everything. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a, a question that uh, uh, we didn't have time to, uh, uh, to discuss, which is Israel. Um, and we discussed that many times in the past. But I'd be very interested to get your thoughts on how Gulf countries uh, as a whole, not just uh, those that signed uh, the uh, so-called Abraham Accord, which were the ag agreement of normalization uh, with, the, uh, with Israel, so uh, the UAE and Bahrain. But if you look at the map of the, the Gulf states, how do you see uh, 
relations with Israel? Because it's probably much more complicated than those that don't follow the, the Gulf uh, thing. So how do you make sense of this new normalization with Israel? Yeah. So the normalization was done in 2020, towards the, the, the final quarter of 2020. And, um, right. uh, and what I would say is that, you know, of course, the UAE and Bahrain have officially normalized relations. And um, we saw a recent uh, public opinion poll uh, done by the Washington Institute. I think his name was uh, David Pollock. Pollack, I think, and um, he found that, you know, since the Abraham Accords was signed, uh, overall, you know, people didn't feel, well, Gulf citizens did not take, take very well to the normalization of ties with Israel. That's number one. But that doesn't mean that they believe that the warming of uh, relations in specific areas, for example, technology transfer, and so on should be omitted. So, you know, I mean, of course, Israel has, you know, uh, Israel possesses, uh, number one, military capabilities, and number two, um, technologies in agri-tech agri and, and water tech as well. So, I mean, they stand, I mean, the Gulf states stand to gain through this kind of uh, either overt or covert uh, deals. And I think an author who wrote for LSE Ian Black, before, I think before the Abraham Accords were even signed, he wrote a paper saying that there were already covert, uh, under the table relations uh, between Israel and the Gulf states. What is important, we should say, is you know, how the Gulf states are actually managing and thinking about their domestic constituencies. You know, um, because, you know, of course, the state narrative, which is led by the top echelon of, of, of the society will say that things are favorable, especially those that have normalized. But you know, anything else, any criticism are all washed out in that sense. Yeah. So should we expect uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia soon or? No, I don't think so. And, and no, I, my, my view is not anytime soon. And, uh, and again, precisely because of the domestic constituencies and the fact that Saudi Arabia was the one that uh, you know, initiated the API in 2002, the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, which of course stands today. Yeah. Thank you. Questions uh, from the auditorium? Yes, Georgi. Uh, yes, uh, uh, wait, wait, maybe for the microphone, please. Thank you very much. I take advantage of my. Uh, good relation and moreover friendship with Kamans, uh, knowing that he has been working in Kuwait and he has a very uh, intricate knowledge of uh, the domestic situation of Kuwait. Kuwait intrigues me very much because I was a frequent visitor there for years and uh, uh, I'm quite amazed that Kuwait is a rather outlying uh, member of uh, of the Gulf community. Uh, beyond what we understand that there are uh, internal domestic constraints, what really explains uh, the aloofness of Kuwait in the Gulf family? Thank you. Thanks, Georgi. Uh, by aloofness, you mean it's foreign policy towards Israel or in, uh, aloofness in? in general? Well, um, I think number one, Kuwait had to go through the whole episode of the Iraqi occupation. And, and that changed its outlook of uh, you know, its foreign policy. That, that's number one. And I think uh, if you look at domestic politics first, you know, prior to the invasion, uh, there was actually a centralization of power. The parliament was dissolved in 1986, and uh, the emir at that time, uh, Sheikh Jaber, he preferred to have an advisory council. So when the invasion came and went, you know, uh, the citizens of Kuwait said, you know, it was because of that, uh, you know, 
that you took away because the leaders took away that the democratic experiment that we offered others a chance to invade us. And so since then, the parliament returned uh, and it prides itself to be the most politically vibrant among the Gulf states, although it has suffered from numerous deadlocks, as I said, between the parliament and the cabinet of ministers. Uh, so that experience, number one, has made Kuwait uh, look inwards rather than outwards. And if you look at the Gulf states, Kuwait is probably the one which engages in tourism projects the least. And that is also despite you know, its good relationship with China and the whole uh, BRI uh, agenda by China in Kuwait uh, called Silk City. If I recall correctly, and you can look, look that one up. Uh, and, and so they prefer to do things you know, to the point where it's just G2G and B2B. Whatever people to people movement you know, uh, on the ground, whether it's because of tourism, whether because of cultural scenes and entertainment, those are not the priorities of the Kuwaiti government. Uh, and, and, and precisely because of that one particular episode that they prefer to keep a low profile, and also because of its long-standing uh, balanced foreign policy in the region, uh, led by the last uh, Emir, the late Emir, Fik Sabah, and, and him being the architect of Kuwait's uh, balanced foreign policy orientation. Yeah. We have uh, a next question uh, coming from Zoom, if uh, you allow me to. Uh, to read uh, from Jenna, and uh, I hope uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, understood it correctly. Uh, so, Clement, you, you, you talked about the economic benefits from the U.S. presence in the Gulf, and in particular for the for countries such as the UAE, Qatar, and Oman. Jenna is mentioning the fact that on at the same time, the U.S. involvement in the Middle East has had uh, negative effects on other Arab countries, and she talks uh, uh, about uh, Iraq or Syria. Uh, she makes a, a mention of the Bush Doctrine, which played a role uh, about two decades ago in US foreign policy. So how do you reconcile these two things? The fact that, yes, this might have had um, positive um, out outcomes for uh, some of the Gulf states. But on the other hand, uh, the US presence uh, at least the way uh, Gina put, puts it, 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 has had negative impact on other Arab countries. Yeah, okay. I think, I think the answer to this is really uh, from the most recent uh, visit by President Biden to Jeddah in, in Riyadh when, when uh, President Biden met the Crown, Saudi Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman and of course, there were reports saying that uh, Mr. Biden actually asked uh, the Crown Prince about the Khashoggi murder, and the response was, the response by the Crown Prince was, you know, the U.S. had made its fair share of mistakes as well, and the U.S. had had to clean up its own and after its own mistakes. So we have, so the Crown Prince said, we have also done our part. So what, what more is there? to be said about this. So that was his response. And I think uh, in response to the question by Jenna, um, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, the US as a superpower is infallible. You know, it, it makes its share of mistakes. It makes its share of wrong or miscalculated uh, decisions. And it's up to the policymakers in Washington to acknowledge that. That's number one. And number two, I think the whole point about uh, double standards should be made. You know, uh, especially when you look at the two crises that I mentioned during the talk, which is uh, number one, Afghanistan, and number two, Ukraine. Uh, why are uh, Afghan refugees, you know, received or treated differently via different quota systems by the U.S. treated differently than the Ukrainian refugees, especially number one in the media, but also in the refugee quota system that the U.S. sought to prop up you know, in, in, in the immediate aftermath of both crises. You know, there was some kind of double standard uh, in, in that sense. And, and before, 
the Afghan refugees were actually eased through the system, you know, the Ukrainians actually superseded or, or even went into the US uh, and at a, at a larger quota than, than, than the Afghan ones. So I think, you know, in response to, to the question, again, I, I'm saying that the US as a superpower, superpower is not infallible, it's not, it's not invincible in that sense. It has its also share of mistakes as well. Yeah. We have uh, another question uh, from Ambassador Mahi Abdelatif, who's uh, with us on Zoom. Uh, and uh, which is, uh, I think, reacting to your uh, last slide, uh, in particular to uh, your, your point on Egypt, uh, is asking, uh, what are your criteria for saying that Egypt is a declining power in the region? Well, number one, of course, uh, I mean, if you look at the quantitative stats, and I showed this in, in the table earlier, it, Egypt has a considerable military force, whether it's active, or plus reserve, or otherwise, or both. Yes, it has a military force, but it has also severe fiscal problems and economic problems, and, and that can't be denied. And, and the Gulf states have, of course, lent uh, an economic hand to Egypt. And if you talk about you know, its political clout in the region, you know, I'm not sure that it has exactly you know, that kind of influence or, uh, in the region where it can be done via mediation or it can be done via um, you know, uh, humanitarian assistance. I mean, if you look at the media, the, the most prominent ones are those from the Gulf states. And, and I think it's, it's as, as, as straightforward as that, I think. Thank you. Asif. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Clemens, for this uh, fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, we have been talking about uh, the power or the competition amongst these uh, Gulf power. Uh, uh, whatever happens, you know, that has been done by the people who are involved. And we are talking about the leadership of these countries. Uh, we see that many of the leaders are very young. So uh, when we get into their decision making or their strategizing or their understanding of the world order or the history of their country or the limitation of their power, uh, have you uh, come across those studies uh, where we can understand uh, the process through which this, this is being done at the apex level, at the leadership level? Uh, because in other countries, we see the system of think tank or certain uh, level of democracy that is there, uh, people discuss in the civil society also, the discussions goes, go on. But in these uh, uh, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, we don't see such things uh, happening. You know especially in Saudi Arabia. So uh, can you give us some uh, glimpses on what exactly happens, what exactly is the process through which uh, this happens, or it is uh, just a random call? Thank yeah, you. so thanks, Asif. I think, Asif, you're talking about youth involvement uh, in decision-making uh, processes in the Gulf. Am, am I right? No, I'm talking about the leadership. Uh, I don't know what it is. Leadership. And incorporating youth involvement or, or not. Where does the leader get his wisdom from? I mean, I think the, the first part of, of, of this is, I mean, of course, in the event when there is a passing or a leadership succession in the Gulf. I think the biggest question, number one, is whether there will be a rupture in the ruling family relations or intra-ruling family relations. I think that's, that's always the first consideration. Number two, would there be continuity or change? Would there be a branch, particular branch of the ruling family that will stand out and consolidate its power, as we, we can see in, in a few of the Gulf states? Um, so how, how do they get inspired, or where do they take inspiration from, you know, from, their, from in general, in terms of leadership? I think number one is, is from their predecessors, of course. Uh, most of them would not break that norm that they have established for the longest time. Uh, I think, for example, let's take Kuwait, for example. Kuwait, Kuwait's new emir, uh, I say new, he's new in terms of his emirship, but he's really old. Uh, but Kuwait's emir, Sheikh Nawaf, has a heavy uh, Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Defense portfolio under his belt. Uh, and that differs a lot 
from his predecessor, Sheikh Sabah, who was from the foreign ministry, and he was the architect of the foreign ministry and the one who crafted that whole balanced foreign policy. So there were questions when he succeeded, when, when Sheikh Nawaf succeeded, on whether he would ab adopt a more heavy-handed approach. But the answer was no. It has been continuity uh, since then. Um, and, and Kuwait has, like I said, you know, refused to meddle in other people's affairs. Uh, which is why it's constrained and which is why it doesn't hit that aspiring middle power status precisely because it doesn't want to project its power elsewhere at all. It just wants to amicably resolve conflicts. Um, and, but of course, if you talk about leadership again coming back, of course there are cases of exception where there are ruptures and, and, and here we bring in the youth. And especially for... Um, you know, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, we are seeing that you know, willingness to integrate and incorporate youth into the administration. Um, and, and if you look at some of the ministers and assistant ministers, they are of a relatively young age. And um, you know, the Saudi crown prince himself is young. The Qatari emir is young. So you have instances where now youth is trying to balance out that whole seniority, the traditional seniority and uh, overview of, of Gulf leadership. You know, it has always been either the 70 or 80 year old uh, you know, father figure that comes to power. But in, in, you know, we are seeing something slightly different at the minute in terms of the makeup of, of the various respective uh, Gulf leadership. We have uh, a couple of questions coming from uh, Zoom. Uh, I'll, I'll start with one, and uh, then we'll, uh, if we have time, uh, we'll go to the second one. The, the first one is quite easy, I mean, quite straightforward. It's about the, the, the blockade of uh, Qatar. And uh, you, uh, you mentioned the Alula summit and uh, what we call the detente uh, now uh, between uh, the Gulf countries. The question is uh, how strong do you think this reconciliation is? And uh, do you think this uh, detente uh, between the quartet and Qatar will last? Uh, so uh, how do you um, predict things will uh, evolve? Okay, so for, on, on that there was initial skepticism uh, on whether such a detente or cooling of relations will last. Um, Precisely because something I, that I said earlier is that you know you may resolve things at the top, but inter-family ties, and we have to remember that you know, some of these uh, families, you know, have relatives across borders, so in different countries, and so that obviously can't be resolved overnight. But what we are seeing, at least on in the political uh, chess piece or, or realm, is that you know. Saudi Arabia, and I said, you know, has been leading that drive towards shaking a lot of hands, making friends, and, and this is something that is, you know, and, and also rebranding, and this is something that hasn't, hasn't occurred in that sense since, you know, the first diplomatic fallout which in 2014. So, uh, I mean, this is not the first kind of diplomatic fallout that they had, they've had with Qatar. And that is not to say that they won't have it again. But at the minute, at, at least in the immediate future, you know, the trend of cooling relations is going to continue. Uh, and, and, and I think the question we should be asking is, who are, who are they going to be shaking hands with next? Uh, and in Greece, well, Greece recently, Greece was one. Uh, France was one. Uh, Egypt was also one. So I think the Gulf states are moving into that phase where they are looking outwards for friends and precisely because what I said in, in the talk was that you know they see a shifting landscape where the US is no longer as reliable as before and now they they will find their assurances elsewhere if it means by shaking hands they will do so yeah still on the uh, the question uh, of uh, relations between uh, Gulf states uh, and again that's uh, coming from zoom uh, one of your slides uh, discussed the uh, growing competition at the economic level between Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, and the question is, will this competition develop along other fronts and become something more? 
perhaps not uh, animosity, but uh, hedgy rivalry, I quote. So how, again, uh, your prediction on that specific competition? Yeah, well, that is something I've been asking all, all our Gao speakers when we have them on other webinars or round tables. And, and they've said that competition is healthy. I think that that is in a nutshell, that competition is healthy. They welcome competition. It helps them to, to improve. Um, whether it be it economic diversification or be it the coordination of their various policies. And now it's because they are taking advantage of that whole cooling climate that they are actually coordinating and sitting down at, at the table to, to talk rather than, uh, and of course, I, like I said, some of them, some of the leaders have just met each other for the first time in, in a long while. So um, we, are, we are seeing this kind of trend occur and we are seeing, um, the fact that you know, even if there's going to be economic com competition, you know, there will always be a back channel for them to uh, reduce tensions if necessary. And I think that whole Saudi UAE OPEC spat was one of them, where they managed to do it on the corridor, for example. And 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 this will this will continue, I think, for in at least the next five years, next ten years. Thank you. Uh, any questions? We have about uh, five, ten minutes left for uh, the Q&A. Uh, or if, uh, in this case, I'll uh, maybe ask the last question, um, which is about China. And you, I mean, this is, uh, I'm not sure if we, I can say the elephant in the room, uh, but uh, you mentioned uh, around the end of your, your talk that we see more and more relations between Gulf countries and China. Uh, you briefly uh, discussed the idea that it's about diver diversification, hedging. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Can you say more about how do Gulf states think about their relations with China? Because uh, historically, this is a region where the U.S. has been tremendously important for the security of the countries, for the security of the regimes, because these are regimes that uh, need U.S. military presence for their stability. So how do you see the growing presence of China? I mean, uh, again, I'm asking uh, like our participants to, uh, for your predictions, but do you see coming contradictions, coming tensions between this U.S. presence and this growing Chinese influence in the region? How do you make sense of that? Well, I think if you look at uh, well, number one, there will be one of our colleagues who will be talking about China, Alessandro, uh, in, in, the coming, in the coming weeks. But I'd like to say that, of course, China has left a huge economic footprint in, in the region. That's number one. Um, whether or not it decides to dabble in the geopolitics of the region is another story. Uh, so far, it has refrained from doing so, and, and, and that's one. But I think uh, if it continues to dabble in economics, which it, which it will, I think it's inevitable that you'll be sucked into uh, one of these conflicts, whether big or small, and when, and as if and when such a conflict uh, occurs. I think uh, one of the indications, and I think I would come back to, uh, you know, one of the notes points that I made in my in my notes uh, uh, on uh, Taiwan and, and the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's. Uh, <coughs> visit to Taiwan. The UAE last month referred to this visit as provocative, right? And and I think you know, despite its ties with the US mm. and in general, uh, most of the Gulf states ties with the US. You know, they have realized that, like I said, you know, the US is no longer as reliable as it once was, and so you know, the approach, the courtship between China and the Gulf states and the Gulf states towards China is sort of mutual at the minute and, and it will continue to grow. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think uh, we'll stop here uh, for this uh, uh, fascinating uh, talk on uh, the Gulf. Uh, just uh, an announcement for uh, next week. Next week, uh, we'll have a duo of uh, Georgi and Asif uh, talking about Iran and Turkey, the question being, uh, we're talking about the spoilers of uh, the, the regional order in the Middle East. So uh, uh, please join us either in the auditorium or on Zoom.
uh, Thursday uh, next week, same time, same place. And uh, before we leave, please join me for a round of applause for uh, Clements. Thank you very much, Clements.